My little heart is pitter-pattering. Bibliosophie. Today, I'm talking about myself. Arguably, I'm always talking about myself. But today, I am really overtly talking about myself because I'm going to answer a bunch of questions that you asked me. I put out a call for um, Q&A questions a little while ago, and boy, did you deliver. With that in mind, uh, this is going to be in two parts because no one has ever accused me of being unverbose on this channel. So already I'm sort of prone to talking a lot about answers. I'm going to try to keep it somewhat short. Uh, but I have about 60 different questions to address. So we're going to split this up into two parts. I've also split the questions up into uh, themes. Before I go any further, also, thank you so, so much for asking me all of these questions. I am utterly chuffed that you are interested in hearing me talk about things. Uh, I am chuffed that you tune in to my channel on a quasi-weekly basis, and I'm really, really delighted, if slightly overwhelmed, let's be honest, that uh, you had so many different things to ask me. So. Category one, books. The first question is really hard for me and I'm not really, really going to answer it. It is, number one, what is your all-time favorite book? That is too hard for me. I'm gonna send you over to a video I made a few months ago called uh, my 10 favorite novels of all time or books of all time. I can't remember how I titled it. I can't pick just one all-time favorite book. Two, what book helped change the way you move through or see the world? And I'm going to combine it with another question, which is book you've revisited the most or that has impacted you greatly, which is not exactly the same. I don't have an answer to book I have revisited the most. The books that I tend to revisit the most, or the parts of books, are definitely poetry. And the book that I'm choosing for what has changed the way I move through or see the world, I think I answered this question in a previous Q&A, and I answered it the same way, in fact, uh, is the poetry of Catullus and the Metamorphoses of Ovid. I did Latin all throughout my teen years and was ardently in love with that, with that language, and with uh, the texts that I was translating, and with the act of translation, and especially poetry. So getting to know these texts at, I think, age 15, and starting to work on translation really unlocked for me the love of playing with language, shaping it, shaping translation, really diving into language. So a language as a playful thing, as a malleable thing, as this sort of mystery adventure, this really, really helped shape me in how I currently understand language and its use. Favorite essay collection. Again, I could have picked so many different things, but I'm going to choose one, and it is Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde. It's a great one to pick. This collection has so many bangers. Uh, it has Poetry is Not a Luxury, uh, The Master's Tools, uh, Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, Uses of the Erotic. So these are really, really fundamental texts uh, that I'm sure many of you have read or seen referenced, or even without necessarily knowing that you have read references to this, you probably have, because it is so instrumental, um, and it's just a really good collection. If you were to write a book, what form and genre would you choose? I think I would probably write an essay collection or a memoir-ish type of thing. Uh, the books that I love to read the most are really books about writing and art and done so in a kind of personal vein. It's 
what I do write when I write, really. Um, so kind of artistic cultural analysis, analysis of works through a, you know, art history, literary history, musicology kind of perspective, but also with a fair amount of personal perspective mixed in. So, you know, something like what Olivia Lang is doing, Ali Smith, um, Maggie Nelson. Do you reread books? If so, what are the books you reread each year without fail? This is a two part question. Do I reread books? Absolutely. I don't as much as I think I should and as I would like to. And I've said this on this channel several times that I wish I reread books more often, that I had that discipline, but you know, shiny new objects are shiny and new and fun. Uh, so I do really, really, really enjoy rereading books. I would like to instill even more rereading into my life um, and maybe make it more disciplined. However, the second part of the question, what books or book um, do I reread each year without fail? That, no. Uh, I don't have a ritual book. What books have made you sob? Um, I have... not sure. <laughs> and so I've just picked the books that I remember making me cry from this year. So there's some recency bias. I mentioned previously uh, Cataline Street by Magda Zabo making me cry. I think I was talking about it in a vlog. Uh, I don't have the book to show you because I lent it to a friend uh, and I don't know if they have been reading it. Love by Toni Morrison, which I listened to over the summer uh, and I think partially listening to it as read by Morrison herself, who has just this beautiful voice, um, was a, contributed to my getting really choked up, but the very end of it really, really made me just, oh, collapse in on myself. Um, so that one, definitely. And also, uh, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us by Hanif Abdurraqib. Um, I, there's this is a collection of essays. And similarly, he has such a beautiful lyrical poetic, because he's a poet, way of writing, and also such an open hearted, view of things, of of what it means to navigate the world and like things and like people, and actually more than like things, love things and love people, um, that several of those essays made me very teary. The perfect thing is that I just talked about books that made me cry and then I sneezed, so now I'm sniffly. Next question is, do you like German books? Absolutely. I don't read as many German books as I do uh, English language books and French language books, but absolutely I have almost never read them in German. Uh, more on that topic also to come. Um, the only book I have read in German is appropriately a novella, it's quite short, and that is Death in Venice. Otherwise I'm always reading them in translation, um, usually into English, but Absolutely. And finally, uh, I'm always fascinated by a reader's mix of books that you decide to purchase, borrow from the library, and read on an e-reader. Can you share what your mix tends to be and what e-reader do you use? Um, I do all of the above. Uh, I listen to books and I think kind of in maybe in somewhat equal parts actually. Um, I listen to books pretty frequently. I tend to have at any given time some audiobook going that I'm either listening to via the Libby app or through uh, Scribd or I think it's Everand now uh, as of like a couple of weeks ago. That's one of the few subscription services that I have actually. Uh, I obviously own a whole lot of physical books. I go to the library a lot and get physical books and then I also have uh, a lot of um, ebooks out. What do I choose to buy? It's a little bit aleatoric. If I can't find it, um, if it's a foreign book that I know is not going to be coming to the United States anytime soon, um, then I will order it online typically. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, you just are walking in a bookstore and um, 
you just gotta have something. I get a lot of secondhand books, uh, but I also get new books, so really all of the above. Uh, and the e-reader that I use is not by any means the best kind of e-reader, I just use my iPad. Uh, I have an iPad Air, I guess, yes. Um, so it's relatively manageable sized. Um, it's not the best thing to read on, but it's it, I'm not going to buy an e-reader. It, it serves my purposes perfectly fine. The next section I'm gonna call, I'm French. These are all questions about my being French. Uh, number one, fittingly, what is your favorite thing about being French? And that is really, really hard. Some of these questions are like making me have a, an internal breakdown. I don't know. It, to some extent, it's just, you know, a, a chance of fate. I just happened to be born in France and have French parents. Um, however, of course, for my cultural life and my professional life, which is also very tied to my cultural life, being French is a huge benefit. Uh, so I can read books that have um, French phrases and not bad an eyelash. I, it has never occurred to me to be afraid of French, which I know is a really overwhelming language for a lot of people because I also teach it. It is a part of my livelihood to know French. It's been a good part of my livelihood. And as a classical singer, knowing French is a huge advantage. Um, so there are many just cynical reasons why being French has been a huge benefit for me. What I think is my favorite part about being French is not about being French specifically, but about being bilingual and multicultural, being sort of a third culture kid. Um, because I've been bilingual almost all my life, there was a period of time uh, when I only knew French. I learned, I did learn English as a second language, but obviously I know it very, very well. Uh, I know it as well as French. I have been really fully bilingual for a very long time and that has really wired my brain in a certain way and that's a huge advantage. Uh, it's a huge advantage for it to be specifically French, which is a language that I really really love and spend so much of my time thinking about and loving, but I think it's such a huge benefit to someone to have just more than one language and have that kind of flexibility of learning and of operation that bilingualism um, affords. So my answer is not so much about Frenchness so much as, you know, foreignness in some way. Uh, and that said, I like, you know, I like many parts of my culture and the, the parts of French cul culture that I know and, and adhere to. So the next question is one that I got from a bunch of people actually in different slightly subtle variations. Who is your favorite French writer or what are some of essential French writers in different permutations? I got this question for good reasons from a number of you. This is gonna be a long list, so buckle in. And it's going to be a rel it's gonna be a pretty traditional list. Um, it seems lame to name really, really important behemoths of French and also not not exclusively French, French language writing, but you know what? They are important, good, and important to me. I mentioned already as writers um, of some of my favorite books of all time, uh, Flaubert and Proust, I'll also add Balzac, so you know, major uh, literary Giants, um, Albert Camus really holds up. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, I have really, has been influential obviously in my life and I'm digging into her again more. I have plans to read more of her in the new year. Uh, France Fanon, really important um, political writer. Uh, if went, now that we're getting into more thinkers, um, Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, and Roland Barthes, and also Julia Kristeva uh, for philosophy are the kinds of things that have really, really interested me. 
in poetry, uh, Apollinaire, uh, Stéphane Mallarmé, whom I mentioned, uh, Charles Baudelaire, and Louise de Villemorin are really people that are, ha have been super formative for my tastes and that I love to go back to. And I'll mention um, some contemporary, er, uh, some younger um, authors that you might not know, whom I like, um, all of whom are women. And yeah, so this might be a little bit more useful to you. Uh, I'll mention uh, Marie and Yai, uh, Chloé Delhomme, Cécile Coulon, and uh, Leonora Miano, whom all four of whom I really like. Okay, <laughs> number three, what is your favorite French book? I don't know. I'm sorry, I cannot do the fav favorite books questions. Would you ever settle completely in France? Yeah, very happily. Uh, I would miss New York. I love living in New York. Part of the reason I stayed in the United States was, however, just purely just lack of imagination since I did uh, my high school in the United States. I just decided to do university in the United States. And then since I did university in the United States, I stayed in the United States. It's a little bit incidental and accidental to a certain extent that I'm here. I would be very happy to go back to Paris. Not completely perfectly happy. Uh, there would be some challenges, but um, if I were to go back to France, ideally I would go back to Paris, but phew, any number of things. And it is really important to me to go back regularly. Uh, the pandemic was the longest amount of time that I didn't go back to France for, you know, visiting people. Um, and I, I didn't think it would matter to me, and it actually did matter. Do you consider that the type of books you read in French are completely different from the ones you read in English? I think I can say that no, the kinds of books are pretty much the same, and that my understanding of them kind of gets just turned into Sophie always anyway. Are there certain instances where expressing yourself in French is more effective and or enjoyable for you than expressing yourself in English and vice versa? I've hypothesized that I would benefit from talking to my mother specifically about my emotions in English rather than in French because there would be less baggage. Um, because I would be able to be a little bit more distant, a little bit more theoretical, because it's not our, our, our home language. It's not our language that we've always talked in. Um, and I think it would give me a little bit more distance. Also, I've only ever done therapy in English. So actually, speaking of specialized vocabulary, probably that could come into play a little bit. But more than that, I think if I were to speak about, you know, what I'm going through in English and specifically to my mother, it, to a home environment in my non-maternal, non-native language, I think it might afford me a little bit of distance that could be helpful but this is an untested hypothesis because we never speak English to one another. So it could be an interesting exercise. This next question is a relatively complicated one about translation and editing practices in English versus French. And I'm just actually going to read it, even though it's long. I was talking to a friend about how French Academy is very rigid with the use of language, and this culture shows up in translations with a lot of notes. Are you so used to notes that it becomes mechanical to skip the ones you don't feel like needing, or is it always something you check out of curiosity or something else? As a reader, do you feel those differences? Do you feel this changes your experience while reading? And my answer to that is similar to my answer about how, what I read in French and English, but also it's how I read. So kind of fundamentally no, the, the editing practices from one language to the other and then, yeah, exactly, the footnote practice, I see the difference. I also don't really care too much, but that's actually not really necessarily because of my 
francophony versus anglophony but i don't know if those are words in english but we're making it so francophonia maybe francophonia um but also because i'm so used to reading so much academic writing so even in English, I'm reading a whole lot of notes all the time. I love notes, actually. Uh, and I'm also undaunted by them. I'm unslowed down. I'm not slowed down by them. I don't care. If, if there are notes that I don't need, I don't read them. Um, and sometimes I will out of curiosity. So it doesn't slow me down. It doesn't change my perception, I think, of the text. Because I also tend to read everything with kind of this this splaying uh rooting sort of consciousness so if there aren't notes i tend to be making notes for myself um anyway so i i really this is a very interesting question that i think could have an impact for people for me personally actually not really i feel like all of my answers to these are no actually i feel exactly the same no matter what what are some of your favorite french words or phrases uh i've picked three for you just kind of for fun's sake they were the first that came to mind uh metagraboulisé I went off on a tangent about the fact that it comes from a Rabelais, uh, but I didn't define it extremely well. It means to overthink, to overwork in your head, uh, to ruminate on something overcomplicatedly, uh, which seems fitting. <laughs> it's not that common, and I just love it. This is very much a family word that I love. Very common word, grignoter, which means to snack or nibble on, and I think it's just gorgeous onomatopoeia, grignoter. Uh, and an expression that's vulgar, so I'm going to teach it to you, is enculer des mouches, which means to fuck flies, uh, literally, i.e. to split hairs, to, um, to be overly particular um, in doing things. And the final question in the I'm French category is, do you speak, read, understand, sing in any other languages besides French and English? As I mentioned, I did Latin. Um, so I read still to this day. I'm rusty, but I can still read Latin pretty well. I, uh, I know Italian quite well, and I do sometimes read in Italian. That's my third most... Um, comfortable language. It's my third most comfortable language to speak in as well. I can converse in Italian without too much stress. After that is German, which I can read pretty easily. Um, and if pressed to, can hold pretty banal conversations in. Uh, I'm, I'm very self-conscious about speaking in German, which is pretty common. Um, because of word order, especially. I can't think in German and in Italian. I can either think in Italian or I can just think in French and translate directly and it's very easy, whereas German is just a lot more awkward for me. So, um, and those are the big languages that I also use for singing. I sing a lot in English, French, Italian, and German. Um, those are really the languages of classical music, Latin as well. Um, otherwise, I sing in Spanish, of various types of Spanish, uh, pretty regularly. Uh, Russian um, and Mandarin are my most frequently used other languages. I can read most... Um, Latin languages, so Romance languages. All right, next section. My career, my creative process, etc, etc. Number one, uh, my experience with morning pages. Do they help me write and create? Uh, if you're not familiar with The Artist's Way, it's a book about art practice and one of the things in it is morning pages, which is to write um, every morning, even when you're just sort of blurry, uh, some thoughts without thinking too much, basically, just letting something flow out of you. I've actually never read The Artist's Way, but I am familiar with morning pages and have 
recently especially tried to incorporate them more into my life. I'm extremely erratic about doing them, but I do think that they are really, really good. I think they're grounding and also they release some uh, creativity. So I really suggest them for you if you have any sort of creative practice, but even not. And I suggest to myself that I do them more often and more regularly. Uh, number two, what drew you to study classical music or vocals? The, the short ter answer is that I was not really a passion and then it turned into a passion. And I, I have been extremely privileged to have the time to let it develop into a passion. If I had not had the support financial and emotional from my family, um, it, I would never have continued it because I didn't have enough of a singular drive for it otherwise. It was just something that I could do, that I liked doing a lot. I always, you need to have some amount of drive because it's so much work uh, and so much specific work, but it wasn't an obsession. It, it grew, grew organically into something that I was extremely passionate about. When did you start to take classes? I didn't really, really, really start seriously seriously until I was about 13 or so. Um, I started a couple of years earlier than that. I did piano when I was a smaller child, so I had a background um, in music. I knew how to read music. I, I started playing piano when I was, I don't know, five or six maybe? Fact check me, I don't remember. Um, but in terms of singing later and seriously singing, I say not until I was sort of 13, 14, really. Do you have a favorite song, type of song, work, or musicians? Um, if we're talking about what I sing, probably my favorite sweet spot of classical music is late 19th century and early 20th century, which also kind of matches up with my taste in poetry and art and literature, some of the people that I mentioned. So that modernist um, stream of thought. Um, I sing a lot of Maurice Ravel, uh, Debussy, Schoenberg, Berg, um, a lot of French art song and chamber music and German language, German Austrian uh, art song, chamber music from that time. I really love. Uh, I also do a fair amount of contemporary classical music. I have a lot of friends who are composers uh, and a lot of friends who are uh, performers specializing in that. So that's a hefty part of my practice also. Uh, and I like a bunch of other music too, but uh, those are the things that I tend to do the most and that I have the most kind of connection to. Number five, do you listen to music recreationally? If so, with genres or artists, any particular composers you gravitate towards more than most? So the composers that I mentioned in the previous answer are also composers that I like to listen to a lot as well. Um, and in terms of music otherwise that I'm listening to that I'm not doing, uh, I do listen to a lot of non-classical music. Um, I tend to listen to a lot of electronic music, um, kind of synth wavy or harder, more kind of like post-industrial stuff, a fair amount of rap, a uh, little less R&B. Uh, those tend to be the genres that I gravitate to the most. Um, and especially kind of with some overlap to one another. Number six, would you say there's an overlap between your love for reading and your love for music? Absolutely. I.e. are there similarities in the way you process, consume music and words? Absolutely. And it is very much my approach to music. The magical thing about singing in classical music versus other instruments is that you're working with words a lot. Uh, and that is so important to me and my approach to performance and digging into a piece of music is really, really sometimes through the words a lot uh, and analysis of the linguistics of the words. I approach music from a very multi-sensory perspective and I approach books from a very multi-sensory perspective. I have said on this channel that it's important to be able to speak 
some of the things that you read, especially poetry sometimes, and to really remember the kind of physical reality of a work for yourself. And I think being a singer helps with that, forces that, and maybe I'm a singer also because I do have this really physical, visceral understanding of what language ought to be and what communication ought to be. Do you have a music collection you're proud of, CDs and records? If so, would love a tour. I don't really have too much physical media. I do have some there and there. Uh, I do have some, but it's not, I'm not a, uh, an avid, you know, record collector, for instance, the way that I have a bunch of books music, uh, physical media, aren't really something that I have. Um, all right, if you're willing to share about your PhD program, uh, would really be it would be really cool to hear about. Uh, I am curious to know more about the topics you're researching in academia. Are you doing a PhD? I'm actually not doing a PhD. I'm doing the music performance equivalent of a PhD, which is called a DMA, a uh, doctorate in musical arts. Maybe. Um, and what DMAs are differ vastly from institution to institution. Some of them are shorter, they last like three years, I think. So mine is effectively just like a PhD, except there's a performance component, so there's not much difference in my case. And I will write a dissertation. Uh, what am I writing on is very much what I was talking about between uh, the connection of music and words. I really want to investigate the inspiration and translation chain be between poet turns, you know, cosmic goo into signifier words. Those get read and translated into something by reader, including by a composer who sets that to music. That music is a representation of the text. It's not just an inspired by situation, it's not just using the text or setting the text in a way that is, you know, fine, good, but really composing the text into musical idiom. And then another translation chain occurs when performers, including the singer who is using the text, um, is subsequently reading and performing, embodying the music, the text. Daydreaming forward in occupations, are you thinking of staying in academia, in the arts, something different? Both. Uh, I'm going to continue to perform as much as I can, as long as I can. I would love to, and I'd love to continue to grow my career in that. Um, the specific kind of niche that I want to create for myself is to really bring in my nerdy enthusiasm about research and text uh, into a sort of more performed uh, teaching practice about music. I have, I have a nascent project idea that I won't get into, but really trying to marry those two sides of me more and more. And number 10, I'm curious what you teach and lecture on all of the stuff that I've been talking about, basically. Uh, I teach French language uh, from introductory to conversation, so a lot of grammar. I love to break down grammar for people, um, but I also teach about literature and poetry. I love poetry analysis um, and about translation. Uh, so currently uh, what I do most is really teaching about French and having a really enthusiastic relationship to the French language in different ways. I think that's where I'm gonna end things for this first part. Uh, my two other sections are about New York City and my life in New York City, and then kind of a bunch of sundry questions about my life and my style and my lifestyle. Uh, so that will be in the next video.
Again, thank you so, so much for asking questions. Thank you for tuning into this video and listening to me try to answer them as best I can. Some of them are quite challenging and I want to be as complete and thorough as I possibly can be. So, see you in the next one. And for now, bisous!